Well, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Morris Hills. I'll invite you to stand. at the fall running away when I'd hear you call but father you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near you from but father you love me still and in love before you laid the world's foundation Destined to adapt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. left your home oh, you left your home to seek out the lost you knew the great and terrible cost but Jesus your face was sad I worked my fingers down to the bone nothing I did could ever atone but Jesus you paid my debt by your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night The spirit you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone The spirit you moved in me your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. In the darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven sent a sin by grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. Yes, I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. Yes, I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Goodness of God. I 
love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of You have been faithful All my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Cause your goodness is running out is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, me. With my life laid down and surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Rest 
and you are the everlasting. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God, the everlasting God, the everlasting. join me in prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for this day that we can be here, Lord, loving you, experiencing your faithfulness. You truly are the everlasting God, and it's through that constant source of comfort and hope that, Father, sometimes we can get through the day because of that only. Lord, we thank you that we can glorify you and praise you in this place today, and as we now turn our attention to your word, Lord, will you come and minister to our hearts as we spend time focusing on you? Lord, teach us today. Let us learn of you today in new ways, in refreshing ways, and in encouraging ways. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning, and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Morris Hills. Good morning. morning. My name is Pastor John. Thank you for being with us today. I'd like to also welcome all of you that are watching online, wherever you may be, and whenever this may be. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Our mission here is helping people grow into committed followers of Jesus Christ. This time, I would like to ask you to please silence your cell phones, shut them off, put them on vibrate, whatever you need to, to not let them be a distraction today. After the service is over, if you would like someone to pray with you or pray for you, there will be people up here in front on either side of the stage. They'll have a name badge on that says prayer, and they would love to pray with you today. So if you would like someone to pray with you or for you, please come on up afterwards. Tonight, our youth ministry, the refinery, will be meeting. That's for current 6th through 12th graders. We'll be meeting from 5.30 to 7.30. We'll be entering around the back side of the building, so we're not through the front, but come around in the back. We'll have dinner at 5.30, spend some time hanging out, having some fun, playing some games, and then some time in the Word focusing on Christ. So that's tonight, 5.30 to 7.30. Well, looking in our programs, the first insert, it's that time of year again. We need volunteers. We need servants for the snow removal team. One of my favorite ministries here because it involves snow which means it's cold, which means I'm happy. This team comes through and they they touch up areas with salt and they remove icy spots after the lot has been plowed and they just make the, the danger spots or the areas clear and safe for you to come in and out of the building during the services. So if you'd like to sign up for that, you can see on the bottom that you can put your name and your number. You can drop it in the offering box and we would be very blessed to have you part of that team. The next insert. We've been talking about Noah's Ark over the last few weeks, and this ministry, this class is going to begin next Sunday during the 11 a.m. service. So a week from today, during this service, Noah's Ark will be beginning, and it's the classroom that's right next to the nursery. Um, For those of you that don't know, the the, uh, Noah's Ark is an adaptive learning environment that provides kids the opportunity to learn about Jesus in a loving and a caring environment that has been made especially for them. You can contact the church for more information, or you can just bring the kids in next week. So we are very excited for this new ministry, and we are excited to see what the Lord is going to do with it. The last insert are the community group questions for the week. We do have extra copies, both at the connection table and at the greeter table on your way out that you can grab. Uh, The Spanish questions are at the connection table. If you are using the Spanish translation headsets, the translator can help you get the questions as well. You can sign up to have these questions emailed to you each week. You can go to, onto our website, and you'll see a drop-down menu that says Get Involved. And when that drops down, you'll see a, a link that says Community Group Resources. You can click on that link, and it'll take you to a form that you can sign up and have these questions emailed to you as well. 
Uh, if you would like help with that, you can stop by the connection table after the service, and they will be very glad to help get you signed up for that. Um, one other very, well, one other announcement before we move on with a scripture reading in the service. Um, for those of you that don't know, within the church world, October is a time that we kind of set aside to focus on our leaders, our pastors, to show thanks, to show appreciation for all that they do. So today we want to spend some time and spend a few minutes thanking our pastor, Thank you, thanking Pastor Jim and Pam for all that they do as they lead us faithfully, not only with the work of their hands, but also the work of their knees, spending time praying, spending time studying and, and, and preparing each week. It is an amazing opportunity to serve, but it's also it's work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of sacrifice. So today we want to take a few minutes and, and bless, thank, and pray him for all this. Um, Pastor Jim has modeled for us not only what a servant is, but he's modeled for us what the hands and feet of Christ look like in all of our lives. And I'm sure if we had the time, we could all line up and one by one go through and, and give testimony about the impact that he's had in each and every one of our lives. Um, so today we want to show our thanks. We want to pray for him. Um, for those of you that brought a, a note or a card, you'll see a basket on the way out. Um, you can drop that, that little card, that little word of encouragement in there, and I know it will be a blessing to him. So let's pray for our pastor. Father God, we are so thankful. We are a blessed church. We are a well-loved and a well-fed group of people because of the pastor that you have called us to be under and the pastor that you have called to minister to us in our lives. Father, this church models eternity because this church is focused on you first. This church's priority is to remove the obstacles so that we can peacefully, lovingly approach you and come to you. And that is modeled by our shepherd. That is modeled by Pastor Jim. Lord, and with his bride by his side, Pam is faithfully, faithfully praying for, ministering to us, and is an example of faithfulness to each and every one of us. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for calling Pastor Jim to be our pastor. Thank you for calling each and every one of us here to learn from this man that you are leading and Lord, as he is following you, he's giving us an example to follow you as well. So Lord, even though it's just one day during the year that we get to highlight this, that we get to show our appreciation, Lord, we want to be a blessing to him every day of the year as he serves and blesses us equally every day of the year. So Lord, I pray that today, Jesus, you would bless Pastor Jim, you would bless Pam, you would remind them today that this is exactly who you have called them to be, and this is exactly who you have called them, or what you have called them to do, Lord, that you have called them to serve this church. You have called them, Lord, to share your words of eternity with us. Thank you, Lord, that Pastor Jim has been faithful to bring us the whole counsel of your word. Lord, I love that he doesn't skip the hard parts. I love that he doesn't skip the things that are, that are uncomfortable because it's in the discomfort, Lord, that we can truly see you in a new way. So I thank you, Jesus, that he is so faithful with your word. I pray, Lord, that we would all be faithful learners because we have an example of faithful study. So, Lord, today we want to bless our pastor. We want to bless Pam. And we want to thank you, Jesus, for the impact and the influence that they have had in each and every one of our lives. Father, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim, for all that you do here. And now at this time, I'd have to have, uh, ask you to open up your Bibles or oh, turn on your app, whatever you're using, to Ruth chapter 1. If you're using the Bibles here in the seat, it's page 240. So Ruth chapter 1, page 240. If you would like a free Bible, we have a stack of them on the shelf as you leave to the right. We also have them uh, translated a Spanish translation so that you can pick them up in English or Spanish. We just ask that you put your name and your phone number in it 
In case it does get left behind accidentally, we can get it back to you quickly. If you're watching online and you would like a free Bible, please contact us here at the church and we would be glad to get one out to you. Well, let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 6 through 18. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. This is God's word. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. So please, please pray for Pastor John, for that baloney he said about me on the, a few minutes ago. <laughs> That's just, yeah. you know, I, I am a very blessed man in this sense that I do not really know what it's like to, or I certainly don't remember what it's like to get up and go to work. Um, I haven't had a job since I'm 24 years old when I first started my first company, which means that's about 10 years ago. And uh, so I'm very, 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 very blessed to, to do that. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the real thanks goes to my beloved wife, who's up in New England, cleaning out some of the stuff from her mother's house right now, and to uh, my three children, one of whom is here, but I will not point out. And uh, because they were the ones that had to make the real sacrifices, uh, most of you, uh, you know, for my wife, she, most of, if you have a husband, hopefully you have him seven days a week. My wife has a six-day-a-week husband, so it's a very difficult thing for that. And so uh, people always say, is there anything I can do for you? You ready? How many of you want to do something for me? Both of you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it. Sit in the first row. So the people coming in late going, where should I sit? (laughs) Okay, that is such a big help. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. But trust me, it is really a big help because uh, I don't want to be sitting people. I like to be standing in the back going, I can't believe I get to do this, God. So if you are a guest with us here for the first time or the first time in a while, there's a connection card in the seat in front of you. Uh, If you'd fill out as much information as you're comfortable with, we would be most grateful. You can dump it in the offering box on your way out, or you can take it to the connection table. They will give you a gift thanking you for being here uh, today. Um, Also, today we'll be talking about being part of uh, God's people, 
And, uh, you know, you can't be God's people unless you know some of God's people, correct? So one of the ways we hope you get to know God's people here is we have a cafe after service. And uh, you can go in there, and everything is free. If you want to put something in the donation box, that would be great. But, uh, and then so you can get to meet other people. Try to meet, if you, you know, if you meet one person every week that you don't know, you'll know a lot of people at the end of the year. You don't have to meet everybody uh, all at once. And, uh, and don't forget to thank the people that are in there that are preparing everything for you. Some, sometimes you're like, well, I don't, I'm not sure. You know, you see them behind the counter. But also you see them once, the, once Barry says, everybody, please stand, and you see those people exiting. It's not that they hate his music. They're going to make the coffee, <laughs> okay? And so thank those people uh, for that. And uh, thanks to everyone who put the Noah's Ark ministry together. Uh, we moved on it very quickly and efficiently. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a process. And, and for those of you who, uh, you know, want to participate in that, if you have any questions, you can contact us here at the church. And always go to the connection table. They have a lot of ways to uh, get you in contact with the church or information or, or et cetera. So we're thankful for that. So uh, let's pray, and then we will get to it. Well, Lord, we come to you today, and, and we continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Ruth, uh, only our second study, Lord. And um, today, Lord, we're going to hear, I hope each one of us will hear from you, uh, a call to come to you or to come back to you. It was uh, exciting after the last service to speak with a few different people who told me that they they heard your call, Lord. And so... um, We also pray that you would help us to understand what it means to be uh, your people, Lord. As we are uh, your people, your family, we're going to be, those of us who are followers of Jesus, we are being in eternity together. Uh, We pray, Lord, for, um, we don't really have many details right now, but um, a young man who I love very much, um, who has served all through his high school career, so faithfully in our sound ministry and now in school down in Florida. Our our dear friend Alex was in a car crash and um, he's in the hospital right now getting a CAT scan, Lord, and we just pray uh, that you would be with him, Lord, and that you would give uh, anyone treating him all kinds of guidance, Lord, and we do pray for a, a good outcome, Lord. We pray for the wars that we find our world in. They're not just two. They're all over the place, Lord, and um, we pray that you would give our leaders wisdom, Lord. We pray for the Noah's Ark ministry, Lord, and uh, Lord, I pray in particular for that ministry. I'm so thankful after praying for that for a long time, Lord. Uh, In many ways, that's why we opened up a family room years ago, but um, never turned into that, and We want this ministry to be a blessing to the kids, Lord. We want it to be a blessing to the families, Lord. We want it to be a blessing to the church, Lord. Uh, But most of all, Lord, I want it to be a blessing to you. I want you to shine your grace and your mercy upon those who you love. And so, Lord, today we talk about more serious topics here in this first chapter of Ruth is there is there is much heartache there is much emotion Lord and I pray that you help us not to just hear the words but just to feel your heart in all of this Lord uh, to understand some things perhaps we haven't understood before and I pray that you would meet with each and every one of us Uh, speak to us Lord through your word and And in this Old Testament book written a thousand years before Jesus came, Lord, we ask as we always do that this book would lead us to Jesus, and it's in his name we pray, amen. Last week, we opened up our study in Ruth with a family that was in what appeared to be a very hopeless situation. Uh, They were God's people. They lived in the promised land of Israel. They lived in a town called Bethlehem, which, strangely enough, Bethlehem means the house of bread, and there was a famine in the land. 
So basically that means that there was no bread in the house of bread. Verse 1, we read that the time was the time of the judges, so that puts us at over 3,000 years ago. The book of Judges written about the nation and the book of Ruth having to do with one specific family. The book of Judges said four times that everyone did what was right in their own mind and right, right in their own eyes, right? And so that's a lot of what we see in our culture today. And we said it was a time of judgment and rescue. God's people would ignore him. They would cry out to him. And then God would send these people called judges to rescue them. We came across a family last week, a man by the name of Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons did what God said not to do. They were afraid of the famine. They wanted their family to survive. And they moved to Moab, traditional enemies of God. And when they were in Moab, the husband, Elimelech, died. Their sons then married two Moabites. They weren't supposed to marry outside the Jewish faith, but they married two Moabites. They were pagans. They, re- they uh, worshiped the god Chemosh, who did believe in child sacrifices. And then what happened next? The sons died. So here of this woman, she leaves the promised land, and she has her husband dies. Her, her children marry, uh, her sons marry two women. She, they probably shouldn't be marrying. And then her sons died. So now, in addition to herself, Naomi is left with two Moabite daughters-in-laws. And obviously, the question now becomes, what should they do? Three women in crisis. Not one of them holds, uh, not one of them has a husband. And in the ancient world, uh, that meant a, a future without a hope. That's not the case today. My wife always tells me, if... If I were to die, she would never marry again. I always say, did I ruin you? And she's like, no, no, just you're my one love and that's it. And then I always say, well, I'll have to think about that. And she always says, you won't last six months without a wife. (laughs) (laughs) And if this past summer taught me anything, in agreement with my one child who's here, I won't say which one, but it is my only daughter. Uh, (laughs) I do agree with her that I might not last a three-day weekend because <laughs> it's been a, been a long summer for me. Also not mentioned and clear, but clearly evident is her sons and wives had no children. Sadly, that was sh- considered to be shameful in the ancient world, very sad situation, and such things should not be so. Just because it's mentioned in the Bible doesn't mean that the Bible approves of it. Now, throughout this passage with losing the, two so- the husband and the two sons and not having any grandchildren, the Bible writer does not place blame on anyone. All he really tells us is he sees life in Moab is, and, and I'm just, you have to read between the lines in these types of things, is that, that life in Moab did not turn out as expected. That's the way it is for many of you, isn't it? You had this way you hoped life would turn out, and it just didn't turn out this way at all. Uh, You learn much over your years as you walk with the Lord, and one of the things I've learned that in such hard times, and I know many of you are in them right now, and I do not want to minimize that, I have learned that faith often means leaving such unanswered questions in the hands of God. Because you're going to drive yourself nuts trying to figure out what happened. And just saying to God. And I, I, I actually talk out loud to God and I, and I do symbolic things to God. And I'll just say, God, this problem, I have to give it to you. Because I can't figure it out. It is beyond me. And even if I knew what it was, there's nothing I could really even do about it. This has this woman, Naomi, and these two daughter-in-laws, particularly Naomi, at a crossroads. And, and, it, and it's a place that we will all find ourselves at times in life. Maybe you're at one right now. And you're wondering, what do I do? A lot of times we get paralyzed by such things, don't we? And what we do a lot of times is we do the easy thing. We stay in Moab. We stay in the land of, 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 of compromise and of sin, or, or we just stay in a place where we're just like, I'm, I'm, I, can't, I can't make any changes right now. 
And to be honest, it may seem easier. But if you are a true follower of Jesus, if you're not, I'm glad that you're with us here today. Please stick with me on this one. Stick with us on this one. I think that God has a message for every single person here today, whether you're watching online or you're listening on the radio. You're welcome here. You are amongst friends. But if you are a true follower of Jesus, here's the reality that most of us have come to realize that the Lord will not usually allow you to fully enjoy Moab, will he? When you go to that place where you don't belong, when you're engaged in that lifestyle that you don't, shouldn't be practicing, you're not going to enjoy it. Why? Because God puts something in the heart of his people in which your heart longs for home. And now this is something where I think sometimes in the church we get a little bit too separated by age. We think it's always being separated by age. But I think some of you young people might do well to speak to an older Christian about this. Because there's sometimes that the hunger for home just really increases. I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. After being a follower of Jesus for 35 years, my heart is growing weary with my sinful nature. I mean, it's just wearing me thin. Oh, I know I'm forgiven. I know God loves me. But it's just very, very hard. It just wears on you. And you think, well, it gets easier as you get older. Well, not me, right? All of us, it's not something that gets easier. For all of us, the Lord calls us to live, or a lot of times the Bible uses the word walk. It's how we live our lives, by faith and not by sight constantly the Bible calls us to return to the Lord in faith and trust. So I've entitled today's message, Time to Return, from the series in Ruth's life that we've entitled From Emptiness to Fullness. So let's pick up where we left off last week, verse 6. It then says, she, Naomi, she arose with her daughters-in-law that they might return. That word return is going to be constantly throughout this chapter from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited. Now, in this case, he had visited with, with comfort, with help, with provision, with food, that the Lord had visited his people, his people, by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was, from Moab, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way, so they left to return, second time that word is used, to the land of Judah. Now, sadly for Naomi, we're not told this at all. We, don't, we have no idea, really, if it's the case or not. She, we're not told that she had been visited by God while she was living in Moab. She only heard that God visited his people in, in Moab, but he visited his people in Israel. We learned that last week that, that Naomi had been in Moab for more than 10 years now, and she finally gets some good news. Is your life full of bad news? I don't know about you. It's like one bad news after another. And every once in a while, you get some good news. Why don't we call that the grace of good news? Just some good news, just to hear something that puts a smile on your face. And now she hears that Bethlehem, the house of bread, has bread again. In other words, God, the holy grocer, came down and restocked the shelves in the supermarket. There was now bread on the shelves. And once again, we need to enter into the story. Don't read your Bible like a, some sterile thing. Enter into the story. She left the promised land. She moved to Moab, and there was all kinds of disaster. She loses her husband. She loses her two sons. And maybe at the same time there was something else going on, maybe her heart was still in the promised land. Maybe her heart never, ever really left there. And it says the Lord had visited his people. Sometimes God visits his people in judgment. Sometimes God, in this case, he visits his people now in grace and blessing. And notice, don't miss this, who the Lord visited. The Lord visited his people. We live in a very individualistic culture. 
We just do. And sadly, it has infected the church. And we have to be very careful that it doesn't infect our lives. And we tend to overlook the concept of community. We, we talk about personal faith. You know, people say it all the time. It's about me and my personal faith. I, I think that is just so far, so short-sighted. Yes, it is about that, but it's about much more. Never forget that, that God has saved you. If you are a follower of Jesus, he has saved you. He has rescued you into a community of God's people. Now, if you were here Wednesday night, if not, I would recommend you listen to it. People were even coming out to, after the last service going, Pastor Jim, Wednesday night, woo, man. And twice I said, I'm going to walk the plank. So now I'm going to walk the plank with all of you. You see, if I tell you every stuff you want to hear, I know there'll be nowhere to sit next week. But since we need a few more seats, I'll clear some few, a few seats out. <laughs> if you don't love the people of God, my heart is very concerned for you. If you don't love what God loves, are you sure that God's heart is really becoming your heart? And God loves his people. God loves his people. Are you sure that if you don't love God's people that you're even a follower of Jesus? That, that, that you, do you love the people that God gave his own life for? So once again, here they are at the crossroads, and that serves as a reminder to us why our gathering together is so very important. When we gather together, God speaks to his people, and it kind of goes like this. He speaks to us in very general terms, in very general terms. That's why I don't like to do specific applications all the time, because I always feel like I'm going to shoot too high for some people and too low for others. But we gather, and God sort of, it sort of goes like this. It's like God's word goes out like this. Kind of, I picture it going up above to the ceiling, God's word, and then being lowered down to each person's individual life to take it and apply it individually. So there will be things today that you will hear, and some of you will be like, oh, I got to remember that for the future, or like, oh, that's really going to help me right now. And today, people say stuff like this. It's very in. It's very cool to say, faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. Okay, fine, but a journey to what? That sounds like to me a journey to nowhere. And we want to be on a journey to truth, to trust, to growth, and to grace, and to God. Faith is, is not a stagnant thing. Faith is something that keeps on moving. And sometimes faith moves in the darkness. And sometimes faith moves in the light. And the Bible, if you read the Bible very carefully, you have to pay careful attention. And this is such a great book for reminding us how we have to pay careful attention. Because the Bible reminds us that faith is experienced in both darkness and light all through life this side of heaven. The Bible reminds us of the Lord, and that, that word Lord is, here is the word Yahweh, the personal God who comes to meet his people in both the darkness and the light. The God who, who ultimately visits us in the person of Jesus Christ. And in the context of, of these visits with the, from the true and the living God, we get through the ups and downs of life. Why? Because he comes. He comes Call upon the name of the Lord in your darkness, in your victories, and wherever it is, and he comes. Notice what we're not told. We're told that God visited his people and brought bread. We're not told, hey, it didn't rain for a couple of years, and it rained again. We're not told, hey, the sun finally shined again. We're not told, oh, they put some stimulus into the economy, and everything got better. We're not told that at all. We're told God visited his people. And now, Naomi hears the call to return. 
Naomi knows now that I want to be where God is. I want to be where his people is. I don't want to be in any part of Moab anymore. This place is not for me. And that is a call, that call to return from Moab, that call to return to God. You say, well, I'm not in Moab, I'm doing good. That call to grow more in your faith is a constant call that God makes to his people. You know, during that thing before the message of Pastor Appreciation Month and and the kind words from Pastor John of saying that I get up here and and, and get to sh- you know, share with everybody God's word every week. Do you know what's happening? Some of you who've been here a long time have said to me, it's so wonderful to watch a man grow right in front of our eyes in his relationship with Jesus Christ. You wanna give me something for Pastor Appreciation Month? Follow Jesus, man. That's what I want for you. That's all I want for you. That's why I do this. That's why I do this. And so Naomi hears the call to return to her God and her people. And what does it say? She arose, but she's got somebody with her, two Moabite women. We said last week the Moabites were the enemies of Israel. And we went through a few examples. I'll just give you one. Numbers 25, the Moabite women seduced the men who were with Moses. You're like, how bad could it be? I mean, how bad could it be? 24,000 of them died. 24,000. So while these three women set out on their journey, we're told it could be as much as 100 100 miles. So just imagine three women. Well, that's not safe. There's thieves galore on these roads. It is really only Naomi who's going home. Would the Moabite women be welcome when they got back to Israel? I doubt it. The Moabites were hated people. How was Naomi greeted when they came to Moab, Naomi and her family? Well, we're not told at all. Could Naomi take care of them? I don't think so. By all things, it seems to be she didn't have anything. She seems to be poor. And what about the people who were in Bethlehem when all of a sudden Naomi walks back into town and they're like, hey, girl. Where have you been the last 10 years? Hey, where's your husband? Yeah, he's gone. Where's your sons? Oh, they're gone. Well, you see what happens when you leave the promised land? Who knows what they would think? Verse 8, I want to read it twice. It says, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. More slowly, and Naomi Naomi said to her her daughters-in-law, so they're heading towards Judah, and all of a sudden, Naomi kind of has this sense of urgency about her. Go, return, third time we hear that, each to her mother's house. Normally, you would say, go back to your father's house, but the the idea is going to your mother's house is hopefully you won't be there very long. The Lord, or Yahweh, deal kindly with you. If you have your own Bible, circle that word, kindly. It's actually, that's actually an expression of the Jews because of their special relationship with God. The Lord, or Yahweh, deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead. As you, the Lord deal kindly with you as the way you have dealt with, with my sons, as the way you have dealt with me in my grief. As you've dealt with with the dead and you've dealt with me. Verse nine is as much as a speech as a prayer. She says, the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her uh, husband or new husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and they wept loudly. Are you beginning to sense the pain? She's telling them, don't go with me. Don't go with me. The Bible writer doesn't comment on whether they should go or not. Rather, Naomi's common sense for them. Naomi basically says to them, this is your land. You belong here. You know the customs. You know the language. You know the dress. You know the diet. More importantly, she releases them from the bond of marriage to their sons who are now dead. She says, go find another husband. 
Both of you, start a new home and a family. What is she saying? I want the best for you. In the darkness of Moab for Naomi, these two women have been a light and a joy to, to Naomi. Oh, yes, they were her daughters-in-law, but we're going to see soon they're no longer the daughters-in-law. Now they're being called the daughters. And they were friends. The grace of friendship. Sometimes we miss such things. That friend who helps carry you through a very difficult time in your life. And now they're there and they're having this hard time trying to say goodbye to one another. And notice what Naomi says. She says, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me and my family. Well, what about, what about evangelism? She's telling them to go back to paganism. She's not saying, come with me to the promised land where we'll learn about God. She's calling them, going them back to that pagan land. But she's also praying that they experience the kindness of the Lord. There's a reason I had you underline that word or circle that word. It's the Hebrew word that's all over the Old Testament. It is the word hesed or hesed, typically translated God's loving kindness. But it also has to do with God's covenant faithfulness, God's mercy, God's grace, God's love, and God's loyalty to his people. It's a very, very difficult word to to define in its totality. God's hesed was ultimately expressed in Jesus Christ. God's loyalty to his people, sending a savior to his people who were, by the way, very disloyal to their God. That is the gospel of the Old Testament, and it is the gospel of the New Testament. Despite her emptiness, God has given her two young women to bond with her, to watch out for her. And Naomi loves them so much, rather than say, come with me, take care of me, and then fend for yourselves when I'm gone. What does she do? She wants said for them. She wants God's kindness for them. I think that this tells us something about Naomi's faith. She knows that God even wants to bless the Moabites. She knows the blessing of God is for all the people of the world. Well, how? In verse 9, she says that you would find rest that you would find rest. Now, most of us think, oh, you get to have a nap every day? You get to sleep in, right? You know, people say, well, you know, Sunday's my only day to rest. That's why I don't go to church. Actually, that word rest is not the way we think of the word rest. You know what the word rest really means in the Bible? Free from worry. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you would like to be free from worry? All right, let me make it easier. How many of you don't want to be free from worry, (laughs) right? Almost all of you raised your hand, right? May God help you to be free from worry. May the peace of God, the Apostle Paul wrote, that surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds. Philippians 4, if you're taking notes. That's what she's praying for these people. And may you find a new husband, to love you and to support you. In the ancient world, there was few jobs for women. It was easy for them to become homeless. Now, some of you are sitting here right now going, well, I don't get this. What does any of this have to do with me? Perhaps God would like you to speak to the Moabites in your life. Perhaps right now, as we talked about the Moabites, there are people that flash right in front of your eyes. And God says, I flash them in front of your eyes, not so you would just think about them. I put them there. Or even now as I'm talking, there are Moabites, people who live away far from God. And he says, I want you to tell them of the hesed, of the kindness, of the mercy, of the love of God. But here's the problem. It is very hard to tell somebody about something you have not experienced yourself. Verse 10. And he said to her, 
And they said to her, surely, some of your versions say, we insist. Another version says, no. We might say in our language, no way. Or for those of you listening in Spanish, no way, Jose. (laughs) No offense to the Jose's in the audience. That is my middle name. They're like, really? James Joseph. So they're like, no way. They said to her, we will return. There's that word again with you to your people. Do you know what they just said? They just told her, Naomi, we are more attached to you than we are to our own people. That's how much we love you. It's also a dramatic shift that we see happening right now in this text. In the first five verses last week, the Bible writer gave us the history, if you remember. That's where we introduced the study. But now, the story is being told through conversations, which means we're really going to have to put our thinking caps on. Verse 11, but Naomi said, turn back. There's like, we're not turning back. She says, turn back. Another version says, return home, my daughters. Notice that now it's no longer my daughters-in-law. It's my daughters. Why will you go, or, or some verses say, come with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Another version says, am I able to have any more sons who could become your husbands? She says, there's no sense in staying with me. It's foolish for you to stay with me. Verse 12, turn back. Another version, again, return home, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, another version says, even if there was still hope for me, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? She's like, listen, even if I was pregnant right now, we think she's about 50 years old right now. Even if I was pregnant right now, you're going to wait for me to have babies. Then you're going to wait for them to grow up. And then you're going to marry them. You'll be too old then. Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? She's like, listen, if you, if, if you come with me, you're going to wait for me to have babies? What do you do if Mr. Wright comes along? Sorry waiting for Naomi to have a baby. They're like, that two-year-old? Are you you kidding me, lady? (laughs) No, my daughter, she says, it grieves me very much for your sakes. Now look at what she says next, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Almost like, don't go with me. There's a curse following me. It is bad. Get away from me. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and they wept again. Some versions say loudly. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. The idea is she kissed her goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Okay, now you can read this and you read the Bible. Maybe it's, you know, six o'clock in the morning. You got your cup of coffee and your, you know, your breakfast thing, whatever you're eating. And you just kind of read it and whatever, but that's, you miss the whole point. Are you feeling the tension? Are you feeling the pain? Are you feeling these women who have been through the most difficult thing you could ever go through? Losing a husband, losing their sons, losing losing family. And they they have been through thick and thin together. And now they're starting to go back to the to the place where Naomi came from. And Naomi's telling them, don't, don't come with me. Choose the common sense decision. Choose the right thing to do. And there they are. Picture the scene, and they're, and they're, and they're just weeping. Now, now I, look around the, I look around the room, and, and, and all the women are like, I'm there. And all the guys are like, well, I guess. Well, let me quote that famous theologian to you, Tom Hanks in Sleepless in Seattle. That's a chicks movie. (laughs) Not to worry, men, the dudes are coming in chapter two. But notice the young woman want to go with Naomi. Once again, they're attached more to her than they are to their own people. 
but Naomi is making a strong case. Be realistic. There is no reason to go with me. Things will be better for you if you stay in Moab. It reminds me of Jesus talking to people when he calls people to follow them of, the, of what we call the, this is a thousand years fast forward, to the New Test cost of discipleship, of following Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, you know, we, this, this works in the church. Hey, would you like a better life? Come to Jesus. Would you like to never worry about Come to Jesus. You'll all walk forward. You'd be a fool if you didn't, right? Unless you're like that guy. That's a dog and pony show, man. That's a snake salesman. And that's what they are. No, Jesus, he front end loads the commitment. He says to the rich young ruler who loved money, he said, take all your money and give it to the poor and then follow me. And then he walked away. You know what he did? He said no to Jesus. Why? Because he loved money more than he loved Jesus. Now, some of you are thinking to yourself, well, that's those rich people. Ah, they love money. Well, you know, rich, poor people can be the same way and everybody in between. Just take out your wallet. If cobwebs and spiders start coming out, well, then you know you're one of those people, okay? And so he says to them, you know, Jesus says to people, following me is not going to be an easy life. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. But follow him where? All the way to heaven all the way to eternal life. And she's saying the same thing. Listen, hey, it's going to be a tough road if you're going to follow me all the way to where I'm going. And could be that Naomi is learning the cost of, of, of trusting and following Jesus. And she's learning, she's learning the trusting and following Yahweh, the personal God, is not always easy. And sometimes decisions have tremendous ramifications. And sometimes life is just full of heartache. But here's the reality. Without any kind of sacrifice, it's hard to talk to people about following Jesus. If you haven't made any sacrifices at all, and it doesn't even mean you need to tell people about them, but if you haven't made any sacrifices of, of, at all and you haven't, you haven't realized how those sacrifices were nothing compared with the joys of following Jesus, you're going to have a tough time talking to people about following Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, we went out to dinner after um, the, the day after my mother-in-law's funeral, and we were sitting with a bunch of people, and there was a woman sitting across from me, and, and she said to me, hey, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? And she said, what... Um, what benefits do you get out of being a pastor? And I said to her, keep eating your food because it's going to be done. It's going to be cold by the time I'm done. And I talked about so many things that is such a blessing for me that so many of you would call me your pastor. That's why I look at Pastor Appreciation Month and I'm like, that whole thing is backwards, man. It should be Congregation Appreciation Month. It is a blessing to serve God. Have there been sacrifices? Well, you know what? I never think about it till people ask me. She just asked me what the blessing was. And it's a true, true blessing. You see, if you've never really made any sacrifices to be a follower of Jesus, do you know what you're going to find yourself talking to people about? Religion. And have any of you noticed that religion is not a popular topic these days? People end up fighting about religion instead of telling people about the hesed of their God, about the kindness of of their God, about the loyalty and the mercy and the grace of their God. There's something also at the end of verse 13. She says this, the hand of the Lord, personal name of God, has gone out against me. Somehow she believes in her heartbreak and her bitterness that God is somehow against her. And you know, these are, when I come to these kinds of things, I don't, I, I read Bible scholars, and I'm always curious about what they think about such things. 
And, and a lot of them are, are very critical of Naomi, and I just couldn't get on board with it. I think in Naomi, it seems to me, it, and, and not, I was not the only one who shared this opinion, in Naomi, it seems to me that sometimes faith and hopelessness can coexist at the same time. Like life can be so hard for you. It can be so grinding you down that you just feel hopeless. Yet, what does she still do? The hand of Yahweh, the hand of the personal God has gone out against me. You know, I, there's times when your faith is just gonna be hard to grab hold of, but keep grabbing. Keep trying to hold on to it. And I don't know about you, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I find her raw honesty to be so refreshing. Everything that's happened to me, can I be honest with you? I'm ticked at God. I still love him. He's still my God. But I'm not happy with him at the moment. And this happens over and over and over again in the Bible. And if you said, i never seen it, read the Psalms. Read the Psalms. Apparently, God can handle it. Yet somehow, that, that it seems to help her stay faithful as she is still looking out for her daughters. She's not making it all about herself. Even in this tremendous grief, I want to do something I normally don't do. Um, I know week after week, a lot of pastors get up there and just say, I just want to share my heart with you. And I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> but maybe because of the recent events in our family, although we lost another family member the year before this, I feel like after pastoring this church for 18 and a half years, there's some things that I've noticed, and I, and I, and I just want to just feel like I need to just speak to you about them. I feel like many of us don't really know how or think it's okay to mourn the passing of loved ones. It's like we stuff it down. We said last week that God knows what it's like to lose a son, for, for some reason, some of us seem to think that, that, that grieving makes our faith look weak. I can tell you this. It does make your faith look weak to people whose faith is weak. But it doesn't make it look weak to people whose faith is strong. Every time a young man or a man comes to me, you don't have to be a young man, comes to me who was very close to his father like I was, comes to me and says, uh, man, how long does this hurt for? My father died one month after 9-11. This is my answer. I will let you know when it stops. I could remember thinking, how do I do life without him? He had been sick for a long time, so I was sort of had gotten used to it. But, but how do I do life without him? Very, very difficult. Our hope is in Jesus. His perfect life, his cross and resurrection. But when death breaks into life, the experience of grief is real. And it's needed. You know, when Lazarus died, Jesus went to his grave and it said that Jesus wept and Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead. And some people say, well, um, he, he wept because he had to bring him back from eternity. I'm not that spiritual. I'm sorry. You got the booby prize, pastor. I'm not that spiritual. Now, the, the word does denote a sense of anger of death and, 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 and sorrow. But I love the next line that John writes and that says, and the Jews said, see how he loved him. And then he called him out of the grave. Grief will come out in some way, often inappropriately. It'll throw you back to the bottle. It'll throw you back to substance abuse. It'll throw you back to whatever your thing is. 
For me, it throws me back into my work. I'm just thinking, well, if I get busy, it's gonna go away. And God keeps haunting me and haunting me and haunting me. No, it's not going to go away. It will come back inappropriately if we don't feel the pain and we don't cry and we don't mourn our loss of someone we loved or even perhaps the loss of what could have been. God knows her feelings and she makes no attempt to hide them. She is angry with God, yet he is still her God. Believe it or not, the pain of death, although it may not feel like it at the time, can draw you closer to Jesus. But that takes time. In verse 14, Orpah takes the road of common sense back to Moab. But Ruth, seeing all this, we're told, clung to Naomi. Because as we will see, she's clinging to her God. Verse 15, then she, Naomi, said, this is the fourth time she says this, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return, there it is again, or follow your sister-in-law. That's the same choice we all have to make. Are we gonna follow the true and living God or are we gonna just follow what might be the easiest? Verse 16, but Ruth said, these are, these are Ruth's first words. I wish to God that our leaders spoke to us like this. I wish wish to God that we weren't going back to leaders from past decades or past centuries with their great words of really spurring a country on to live for one another, to live for the betterment of humanity instead of this just anger and this vomiting on one another. It's just just terrible. But Ruth said, these are her first words, entreat me not to leave you. In other words, don't, don't, don't plead with me to leave you or turn back from following after you. Look at this. Forever, for wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And now look at what she says next. And if you have your own Bible, you need to circle this. Because to me, it seems like she has been transformed by the grace of God. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Verse 17, she says, wherever you die, I will die. In the ancient world where you were buried was a big deal. And there I will be buried. And the Lord do so to me or the Lord punish me or deal with me. And more also, if anything but death parts or separates you and me. When she, Naomi, saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. She was speechless. She was speechless. Ruth's words leveled her, just leveled her. The power of God's word leveled her. Where had she heard such things? Well, perhaps, perhaps Naomi had shared scriptures with her. Moses wrote these words, Exodus 6, 7. The Lord said, verse 7, I will take you as my people and I will be your God then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Moses wrote this word. God said this, Leviticus 26, 12. I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. Similar wording in in God said to Abraham in Genesis 17. Maybe she had heard those words from Naomi and she's like, this is what I want this thing. I want this. Verse 16 is just sheer beauty as Ruth commits herself to Naomi, to her God, and to her people. She pledges herself a covenant loyalty to all of them. Not an easier life. 
I'll deal whatever with life throws at me, but I pledge to you covenant loyalty. Basically, Ruth says, stop telling me to go home to Moab. I'm not going home. I'm not going back. For years, I have said this to our congregation. I lived in Egypt. In the Bible, Egypt is a type of sin. I lived in Egypt for the first 29 years of my life. I am not going back to Egypt. I'm not. I'll die before I'll go back there. That is a place of death to me. I'm not going back there. And I don't want to see you guys go back there. And every time someone goes back there, I will tell you this. You do take a piece of my heart with you. And you do take a piece of the heart of these other people in your family when you do that. Because it may not feel that way to you, but you are loved here. It's not about who shows up and who doesn't. She says, don't, don't, don't tell me to go back. I'm going to my new home and my new people and my God. And Ruth uses the covenant name of the Lord and says, I belong to you now. And I belong to your people now because I belong to Yahweh now. I belong to God now. It seems to me that, and some disagree, that Ruth the Moabite, who was not one of the people of God, now is. And she made a decision of faith and trust in the Lord. The Apostle Paul, after Jesus ascended to heaven, wrote this to the Thessalonians, who was like the best church, man. These guys were on fire for Jesus, and they were complete idol worshipers. He said this, 1 Thessalonians 1.9, he says, How you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And that young church was spawning out all over the place. All those new believers, they didn't know all this stuff that a lot of us know, but they were just telling people about Jesus. And when Paul uses the term true and living God, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems to me that Ruth has decided to believe the promises of God, not the promises of the world, not the promises of false religion. Jesus had the same thing in John 6, a very famous passage called the Bread of Life Discourse. He's teaching the people. And what do the people say? This is a hard saying. <laughs> this is a hard saying. Sometimes people walk out of the service and go, Jim, Pastor Jim, man, that was a hard sermon. I go, well, thank you. Thank you. Nothing wrong with a hard saying ministry. This is a hard saying. And it said after that point in time, a lot of people stopped following Jesus. And Jesus turns around to the apostles, and he doesn't say, hey, guys, thanks for staying with me, bro. I really appreciate it. No, you know what he says to them? You want to go too? Now, if I was Jesus, I would have been like, please let them go, God. Please, please. Now, if you say, I don't know anything about the apostles. Read the, read the Bible. I know you think that they walk on the water. They don't. They sink. Okay, only Jesus walks on the water. Then Peter said this, John 6, 68, but Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, you are the chosen one, you are the anointed one, you are the Savior, the Son of the living God. Son means nature of. You are the nature of God, that means you are what? You are God, we know it. And as we go along in Ruth, we will see how God's providence, God's ordering of things is at work even in the dark. The Lord turns darkness into light. And as Ruth says to Naomi, I will bring you home. And that is the same thing that Jesus Christ says to each and every one of us today. I will bring you home. You need to just trust me. I went home, I will bring you home. For a follower of Jesus, and by that I mean not that some you're a religious person who goes to church, Jesus said you need to repent and believe. You, repent means you need to turn to God, turn away from your sin to God and believe, put your trust in Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be encouraged that once 
we were not God's people. But through faith and trust, now we are, and the grace of God, now we are God's people. We are in the family. We are in the family of God. By grace, through faith. And in the Bible, we see this over and over again. What God can do through one person who is sold out to Jesus. One person. One person can make a huge difference. To those of you who are new to the faith, you think to yourself, I don't really know enough. I don't really know enough. Well, let me tell you something. Give me an on fire new believer any day of the week versus some cold, head-filled person who knows a lot about Jesus but doesn't want to tell anybody about it. You can work with that new believer. And, and it's very interesting that, that those who are new to the faith are often the most effective carriers of the good news, telling people how to find the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through Jesus Christ who did much more than Ruth did for Naomi. Our mission here, we tell you all the time, is helping people grow into committed followers of Jesus Christ, but there has to be a starting point for that. And that starting point is sharing, someone shares the good news with someone that God gave his life, that God became a man and gave his life on a cross for you. You say, I, 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 don't, I don't think I know enough. Well, actually, out in the hallway, we've got these blue cards that's called, what is the gospel? So go grab a pile. You say, oh, I know a lot of people. Listen, order a box of 500. I'll gladly buy them for you. Gladly. But you can't just hand them to people because people are going to be like, oh, it's religious baloney. Remember, you're the message. And here, you has got a little thing you can memorize in 60 seconds. You don't have to say it word for word. It's not the words. It's the concepts. And I know that most of us can memorize that. Ruth should inspire us. The outcome of Ruth in Naomi's life is that we should reach out to the Moabites of the world. We should reach out to the people who have heard about religion and they're done with it. You want to know something? I'm with them on that one. When people go with me, I'm done with religion. I'm like, there's something we got in common. I'm done with it. I left it a long time ago. But they have not heard the truth of the gospel. They have not heard the said, the kindness, and the love and the mercy of God. In our country, the prophet Amos said, there is a famine of the hearing of the word of God. And someday we'll preach the book of Amos. I don't know whether we'll do it on a Sunday or a Wednesday. Pastor John said we'll have to uh, you know, reinforce the ceilings. They might fall down when we preach Amos here. But it's not a famine of the printing of the word of God. It's a famine of the hearing of the word of God. And may we be the people serving the bread, or as the old expression goes, may we be beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. Perhaps you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus. Jesus left his home in heaven to die on the cross in your place for your sins so you could become one of God's people. So there would be no punishment for your sins. So there would be no death for you. For that to happen, for you to get to heaven, you must, the gospel is, the good news is, you must turn to God and put your trust in Jesus. And by faith, choose Ruth's path home to God. If you're not a follower of Jesus or you want to come home, there'll be people up front here to pray with you and for you after the service. Please take advantage of it. If you want to know more about Jesus, that's why I hang out in the hallway. I don't hang out in the hallway to make small talk with people. 
I want to hang out with people in the hallway who want to say to me, you know, I, I want to know more about this, Jesus. I've been sitting here for a while, Pastor Jim, or maybe this is my first week, or some people I've been sitting here for five years, and all of a sudden something is just clicking in me. I don't really know what's going on. That's why we're here, because we want to help you make that journey returning to your creator. So you're part of with us in heaven for all eternity. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you just, <laughs> you give us these passages in the Bible that don't, they don't hide anything. They just are so raw, so honest, so incredibly emotional at times. I pray for all of us that we will return to you, Lord. I pray for those that, that don't know you, that maybe they know they're Moabites and they want to come into your kingdom, Lord. I pray that right now, where they're sitting, they would just trust in you. It's not about some prayer or some sacrament or something like that. It's about just simply saying, God, I have not followed you, and I'm turning away from my sin to you. I need your help. I need your forgiveness. I need you to rescue me. And I put my trust in the sacrifice for my sins, Jesus Christ on the cross. And I put my trust in him instead of myself. I pray for some that might be here today that have been not close to you. They have not been walking with you. And they want to return to you that today would be the day that they would return. And as the worship team comes forward, we, we thank you, Lord, for these passages about real people. So often we read in our Bibles and we only think about the heroes in the Bible and we we skim over those who, who seem to be having a faith crisis. We skim over those who, who may not be living up to everything you would have for them. But we thank you that you don't skip over them. That they are important to you. And Lord, now I pray just over these people, Lord, that from heaven would drop down the said that your kindness, that your love, that your mercy, that your grace, that your covenant loyalty would be sensed by all of us, whether it be in the darkest moments of our life, the brightest moments of our life, or how most life has lived, everything in between. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite you to stand. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow Big love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is real. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh, no, never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you never let go every high and every low. Go of me. I could 
Just as a reminder, there are people up here, up front, waiting to pray with you, for you, or to share the gospel of Christ with you if you want to know more about that, or you can see Pastor Jim on your way out. 